So today I'll be just talking. Okay. So today I'll just be talking about Web three from a non technical person's point of view. Like a lot of people who've heard about this space, it sounds really interesting, but it's really hard to understand it from a non technical point of view. I've been there. I've done that. I, as much as I'm studying CS, I'm not the best CS kid out there. I'm a lot more business minded. So for me, getting involved in the space was much harder. So I'm just going to walk you through that today, and we'll go over how you guys can build effectively in the space, how you guys can get involved in the space if you're not a technical person. And if you're a technical person, how you can sort of implement some of the ideals in the space in a technical sense. So can everyone share my, see my screen? Yep. OK, sounds good. So let me just put this in here. And perfect. So today, we're just going to go over three things, the history of the internet. So we're going to go over the basic. Web one, web two, web three, sort of ideals, paradigms there. And we're going to develop the idea for why do we need web three. Web three is this sort of mystic idea. Everyone thinks they know about it. Everyone has this like sort of tidbits of information of what it is actually, but no one knows why we had it or where is it actually applicable. And then from there, we're going to go over the idea of how we're going to implement the paradigm. So web three, the best way to think about it is a paradigm. And what we're going to do is we're going to take and look at the paradigm and see how do we implement it. So what are the high level data structures? What are the high level tools we have access to that we can implement it in a technical sense or implement in an operational sense? And then thirdly, we're going to look at design considerations. Does the Web3 paradigm or just building in a Web3 format really make sense for your project you're doing? The key thing that we're really trying to understand throughout at the end of the presentation is regardless of whether you're going to be doing the tech stuff in your project or if you're not going to be doing the tech stuff, you want to really make a decision that makes sense for your project. If building in a Web3 or using Web3 ideals for your project does not make sense, don't use it. And if it does, then it makes sense to use it. So I'll take you through all that and basically break down some of the myths at the end that really just make it a lot more confusing. So for everyone that don't, doesn't know me, my name's Jay, pretty obvious, but I'm here to basically talk about that, talk about Web3. I'm also the co-founder of Starlight Kitchen. We're a Web3 advisory firm. I'll talk more about that at the end, but what we do essentially is we work with startups, governments, local governments, provincial governments, state governments in the states, and high net worth families that are looking to diversify into Web3. What we do is we provide the state governments and governments with the tools to help make their cities more crypto-friendly, help implement crypto education down their schools, analyze their policies to see if crypto and it's really a friendly crypto tech innovation. We work with a lot of startups on how do we help them get from zero to one. If you have a great idea or if you're even at the hackathon, if you guys build a great project and you guys think it, there's some merit to it, we you guys can definitely book a time to chat with me. I'll go over with, with you, see if there's some merit to it, how we can construct it into a startup and we'll give you the resources there. And then we work a lot with like high net with families and people who are literally looking to diversify their assets into the Web3 space. So people who have like tens of tens or hundreds of millions of dollars that don't know about the Web3 space, we give them the tools and resources they need so they can diversify their asset class and assets in here. So let's get started with a bit of history. So the history of the internet. A long time, like not even a long time, well, 20 to 30 years ago, we had like the first iteration of the internet called Web 1.0. And this was sort of the beginning of the information revolution. Web 1.0 was this place where you could read or you could read only on the internet, but you can really write. And what I mean by that is, if you were like, think about Wikipedia today, if you have Wikipedia, how it is today, you could write on the Wikipedia page if there's some information that you have to update or if the information is outdated, but you could also read in it. So it's a read and write format today. But back then it was practically read. It's a really static page. For those of you with personal sites, you guys know what I'm talking about. There was no content management system, no backend connections. It was basically, here's a front end, here's what it is. So if I wanted a site that says, hi, it's Jay's Encyclopedia about Canada, I would basically list every single fact I know about Canada. But once it's outdated, I actually had to manually go in there and change the code, the HTML code to update the information. The problem with that is only people who had technical information could get involved. Only those people who knew how to make a personal website using HTML code or using code, code and language at the time could get involved. And what that did is really limited internet access to people who had technical knowledge. And it really just made sure that if you had a website and had to be updated, it was really a tedious task of going in and updating it. So the problem was there was no backend connection and you could only read. So the best part about that though, was we had access to information. Everyone was now able to access information worldwide. And that was really useful. Then we went to the web two revolution. 
or the Web2 sort of paradigm. What the Web2 paradigm did, it was really useful because you had now had access to a backend. We had we were able to read and write. So on Wikipedia, I could really I could talk about all about Canada. But now if there's information that has to be updated or information that could be added, I could go and change it without having any technical knowledge at all. I could change, I could type some stuff, it'll get updated in the back end, the back end will update the front end of the website, everything's changed instantly. It's beautiful. What this gave really rise to is the data revolution. Wikipedia now has access to the data of what articles reviewed a lot. Now, that's not the concern we have here. The concern we have here are companies like Facebook. We have concerns with companies like Apple, Amazon, Microsoft. All these big tech companies have access to all their data. At some level, it makes sense that it does help us. But at some levels, it really just tends to harm us. We have seen this with Cambridge Analytica, the 2016 election. There are a lot of areas where we have our data being used against us. So what if we were, what if there was a way we could own our data? What if there was a way we could own what we're writing to the internet? Currently, whatever I write to the internet is owned by the corporation I'm writing to, is owned by the website or application I'm writing to. And that's where the Web3 paradigm is. The Web3 paradigm is, exists to provide ownership to what you're writing to. So that's sort of the three, there's the internet. The Web1 paradigm was basically read only. Web2 was read and write. And Web3 was read, write, own. And that's the whole idea and the whole revolution we have behind Web3. We're democratizing our data revolution. So before we move on, are there any questions about the history of the internet, anything of that sort? Five seconds. Great. So let's move on to really trying to understand the Web3 ideals and we'll basically quote unquote build a Web3 application or design it. So the ideals for the Web3 for web are read, write, own. What that means is if I'm building a social media app, so we'll design a social media app, we want to make sure that we're able to own the data. If you want to pull our data out of the system, we can. If you want to make sure advertisers don't get access to our data, they don't. So how are we going to design an application that does that? Anyone have a sort of general framework or idea of how we would do that? Five seconds before I sort of talk about it and give the answer. Five, four. Okay, something to the chat. Yep, so we're getting there. We're getting to the blockchain. But we want to build some intuition of why we want to use a blockchain or why we want to use a decentralized mechanism. So we're going to try looking at the first iteration to rebuild it like this. Very simple. It looks, it, you have your user permissions where users can read, write, control. You own your data, you control your data, but the company also has the same permissions to read, write, and own. Now, this seems different. This seems like it's perfect. You could, if for those of you who don't know about blockchain decentralization, this seems like it could work in the sense that the social media can can control, can owns the database, but users can control their data. However, there's exists a problem here. Right now, the social media is incentivized to maintain control of the data and ownership of the data amongst the users. They want to give users the ability to vote on the data, to make sure the data isn't sold to advertisers because they want to gather a large amount of users. What if the social media company has its incentives now aligned with advertisers. What if their incentives are now aligned to sell your data to advertisers? In that sense, all the power is wielded by the social media company and they could completely go and say, you know what, users don't control their data anymore. Users don't own their data anymore. We're shutting that feature down. And they're gonna start selling your data to advertisers. And we have a problem here. We're back to the Web1, Web2 framework. So the Web3 ideals cannot be implemented in an architecture system like this. The problem here was centralization. So the solution is decentralization. So a basic idea of what decentralization is for people that are not really aware of it, decentralization is where you're taking whatever ideas or whatever control or systems you have and basically spreading it across multiple nodes. So we've been doing decentralization operationally in businesses for almost since the beginning of time. The best way to think about it is if you have a Coke manufacturer, what Coke you have something in the chat. That's a really good question. So I'll so I'll basically cover that thing at the end too about 
it's because it's a really big problem that is actually happening in the Web3 ecosystem. So let's go on about decentralization. And that's a question we'll save to the end. So the idea with decentralization, we didn't need it for time. We look at Coke. Coke is like a bottling company. And what they do is not, they don't make Coke in a central factory and they ship it out everywhere. The problem that comes in decentralization, if you, op if you operate a big company like Coke, is you start having all these different, you start having many issues. All your supply chain is dependent on one thing. Can you ship your supplies from wherever you're sourced down to one factory? You have to plan logistics from whatever Coke, wherever the main factory is located to all the distribution points. So what does Coke do? They have multiple bottlers. They're able to sort, you're able to source and each bottling plant is able to source its own source of ingredients, is able to source its own bottles and is able to bottle each thing for each region individually and send it out. That's why we've been using these decentralization in operational context. We're able to split not only power, that's one part of it, we're able to split the management of resources and operations across different nodes. So each bottling plant is a node. The problem was for the longest period of time, we've been, we were struggled to basically understand how we could implement it in a technical context. Operationally, we've been able to implement it, but in a technical context, it's always proven to be a challenge. So how do we do that? So Hold on, is it working? Yeah. So the way we do that is with the blockchain, right? So the blockchain is the way we basically implement the whole decentralized thing in a technical sense. Well, let's go back and see what are the problems that decentralization actually solves. The first thing is flexibility. Decentralization allows each node to be flexible. Consider this, Coke has multiple flavors, you have Coke Zero, you have Cherry Cola, you have a multiple. If I have Cherry Cola selling more in one region, how can I, can I scale production for that in a centralized facility more? Or would it make more sense to only scale that field manufacturing of Coke Cherry Cola in one area? It makes more sense to scale it up in one area because it makes it more easier to be spread out. It makes it more relevant to that area and the ingredients can be sourced there. Second, it's scalable. It allows for more scalability. If you have a decentralized network, if I have more production in one, in one area, I could scale production for that one node. And as soon as it goes down, I could scale back production. And third, ease of governance. It's really easy to implement a voting system or control mechanisms using a decentralized system. So the key idea we see a lot is everyone likes to decentralize. When you want to design something, you want to decentralize everything. Operationally, this tends to be the products you sell or manufacture the products you sell, right? So Coke, you're going to decentralize the manufacturing of Coke. But I, let's see some here. Okay, so that's a, all the questions are great. We could basically answer the question for scalability. So the best way to think about scalability and propagating through network takes, of course, it does take a long time, but we have innovations in place, like technically when we're implementing it to speed it up. Uh, we have, uh, we look at mining, we're basically moving away from a mining protocol to more staking protocols that really just speed up transaction speed. Scalability in the sense is not like how much, you, how many users we can acquire, right? At the end of the day, each node or adding more nodes, of course, that's going to take a lot more time or energy there. But every time we're, ability, we're able to scale the, each, the operation that each node does, that that's what we mean by scalability. So you look at Ethereum, we could probably get a bit more technical, but Ethereum is like a layer two network. So the, it's like a layer one, but it's like a supercomputer. So on it, the Ethereum is like a large blockchain. And on that blockchain, you could build applications. Each of those applications on top of that. Now, the problem is, as Brad said, it's very not, it's not scalable because there's a huge transaction fees. It's really slow, but you can really scale up certain node sizes or certain nodes by implementing others, by implementing operational things there. So you have layer layer three networks or layer two networks where you can now take transactions, operate them more on one node, roll them up and pass them through to the main node. And that's essentially what scalability means. So by decentralizing this stuff, you could take what it traditionally would be taking the same, it will also take the same long if you were to do centralization, but you could decent by decentralizing scale, scale, scaling the stuff for each node, you could basically make it scalable. Hope that answers Brad's question. So in a decentralized and technical sense, you want to now, 
centralize data or governance. So yeah, you want to decentralize data or governance and that's essentially what we have here. So data could be the user data you have. So if you're just running something like, med if you're running like a designing an application for storing medical records, you want to decentralize the data. You don't want some single singular person having access to all that data. Or in the case of the social media app, you want to decentralize governance. As Brad mentioned, there are, really, there are problems when you scale an actual decentralized network. When you try scaling a large decentralized network with social media, you're submitting a lot of requests, you're adding, reading and writing a lot of things. So what would make more sense? The fact that you could decentralize governance and you could allow and scale your governance thing because you're, you're not, it's easier to scale and it's more cost effective and it makes more sense. So there's a lot of, a lot of uh, design considerations that you want to decentralize data or governance and we'll get more to that later. So we are where the blockchain is. The blockchain, as we've just mentioned, is a way to technically implement it. Now, the really important way to understand is decentralization in a technical sense is implemented through things called distributed ledgers. The most common distributed ledger or implementation of distributed ledgers is the blockchain. There are other things like distributed cyclic graphs and other ones out there, but the most common is a blockchain. So if people are pitching you or you're really trying to think of a Web3 idea, try understanding that decentralization is happening through the distributed ledger and a distributed ledger is not a blockchain. A blockchain is an implementation of distributed ledger. So that's like a key distinction and a really that most people don't make, but it's really important to make it because there are going to be other technologies that allow you to implement distributed ledgers. The fundamental idea is a distributed ledger in a Web3 context. So there are benefits to using a blockchain, right? The first part, so for those of you who really want to understand how a blockchain is architected, I'll send a video at the end, but uh, at the end of the presentation, you guys can watch it. It's a really good video that explains it technically, but for the purpose of time, we're going to cover like a really key idea of like the visual of how to do it. A blockchain is where you have a chain of blocks, as the name suggests, but every subsequent block is linked to the first block. So for those of you with a really technical background, you could probably think of this as a linked list. For those of you that do not have too much of a technical background, just think of it as if you've ever like been on a ship or you've ever seen like a ship, like a chain, it's literally like a chain. So every block is connected to another block. And if you were to take off one block in the middle, you got to now change, you now got to change the whole structure of blockchain. Down here. Exactly. I think Amol really got, got it correctly. Like if you think of it as a long chain, that's like a better analogy than a chain. If for those who can't, that wouldn't be able that be hard to visualize a chain, but a long train, if you want to take out one container, or one sort of a part, compartment from the middle as coaches, exactly. Coaches can be added as time passes, but you cannot take off the one from the middle while the train is running because one thing is left behind and all the new things are left behind. So that's the best way to think about it. A long train as new coaches are added, as we have more data, as we have more things happening on there. But at the same time, you can't remove a coach in the middle while the train is running, it's gonna cause operational issues. And that's how the blockchain is designed in a technical sense to, you could look at it more technically, but it's designed that way to basically prevent anyone changing things that happen in the middle. So that really makes the best part of it. It's really immutable. So any data you have or that is stored on the blockchain, you can't change it because you're gonna change the whole structure of a blockchain. And the way the blockchain is constructed like a long train is every node has a copy of the train. So if every node has a copy of how the train looks and you were to change the copy, and you were to change the way the train, one the train looks, they have the option to accept or reject it. The way they accept it is all, every node has to be in consensus for how they're going to accept it or they could be in rejection. So, or they could reject it if they don't feel it's consent, they don't agree to come to a consensus. So if you were to change data from one point, it's all going to come to a halt and the blockchain would basically reject that change you proposed. So that's part about it is it's immutable. Now, the drawbacks of using a blockchain is something that Brad mentioned is it's really hard to scale and it's really cost, it's really expensive cost-wise and computationally. So current mechanisms we have for blockchain are, I've got something to chat here. Yeah, it's computationally expensive also relax, depends, means the speed is gonna get closer. So the best way to think of like why it's why there's some drawbacks or what's the problems there is to add a new train or to add a new coach, you really need you need to do a whole mathematical puzzle with through current systems, which is proof of work. And the best way to think about it is you have all this data here, and you have you know you have your previous block. You have to solve a mathematical puzzle that creates the code or the si signature for a block, right? 
It's a mathematical puzzle that takes a lot of iterations. There is no mathematical formula there. It just has to happen through guess and check. There have been lots of studies done to reverse engineer the proof of work mechanism, but it's almost impossible. And trust me, if there was some way that someone has reverse engineered it, they would be able to mint a lot of Bitcoin and be insanely rich. But that's the first drawback. It's really computationally expensive to add a new block. There are new mechanisms, proof of work, proof of history, to come on and proof of like stake to come there and reduce the computational cost of this. But those are taking a lot more time to implement with Ethereum doing it this summer and to have a whole proposal plan for it. And there's problems that do come in the proof of stake that I think will address Monica's question we had at the beginning. So we'll definitely go back and rev like talk back about the changes we have there. Secondly, is, as Emil just mentioned there, speed, it's computationally expensive there, but speed also is, it's hard to access data from a certain block. Because if you were to do like a traditional like link list style, you can't go and access, it's not a list, like list list. You have to go and go to the first data. It's like a data structure. You have to go back by each node and eventually get to the one you want. So those are the drawbacks there. The key thing to understand is blockchain is the best part if you have data that doesn't want to be changed and you want to store the data there. You don't want to use a blockchain when you really, when you're trying to be so sure or you're, you're, you want speed in your application. So with data and the governance, we went there. So if you have an app that processes a lot of data, like a social media, you really do not want blockchain because you're gonna be adding a lot of data on your app. But you wanna decent, you wanna use governance, you wanna have blockchain for your governance because the benefits of it is it's immutable. So if everyone votes on it, the vote can be there, no one can change your vote and that's there. And you come over overcome the drawbacks because no one's voting on how their data has to be used every day. It happens when someone does proposes something new to the network. So those are the key considerations you want to have there. So how do we really implement this technically? So I mentioned the Ethereum network is a really cool as a layer two, it's like a super layer one, it's a supercomputer. So the Ethereum network in general relies on something called smart contracts. And smart contracts are these are literal contracts that execute automatically with code. So the best way to think about it is like an if then statement. So it's if I have borrowed $100 from Kelsey, then Kelsey's account is going to show minus $100. And it could be like, if Jay's account does not have a balance of at least $110, automatically then automatically liquidate his account and give all the money to Kelsey. So smart contracts are really useful for governance because as we just, because we just had a discussion, social media, let's see, everyone votes in favor of a proposal someone had. Then as soon as it's stored on the blockchain, we could have that smart contract execute based on the result you have there to do something. So it could be like implement the proposal right away. So smart contracts are really useful when you're trying to implement the result of a voting or governance activities. Tokens are what you want to have when you want to decentralize or really store transactions on the blockchain. So the best way to think about it this way is if I am now borrowing the $100 from Kelsey, let's say the $100 for 100 tokens. That 100 tokens get stored on the blockchain that I've boarded from Kelsey. And tokens are the best way to, de to basically put it, de sort of decentralize it because she can see, everyone can see that and it's access to everyone. It's on the blockchain. So no one can say that, oh, I cannot come out tomorrow and say I never bought the money and run away with Kelsey's money. The money, it, the transaction is there. So smart contracts and tokens are two tools you do have access to when you're trying to implement the blockchain, right? You're, when you build your applications, I think this is gonna be very apparent to you. The blockchains are already built and we'll go over it further, but we have a lot, we've come a lot far a long way from Bitcoin even. So Bitcoin was like your first sort of blockchain, your first generation of a blockchain. And the best, what it did is really just store transaction data. And that was it. Ethereum is what we are basically framing a lot of smart contracts and tokenization off is Ethereum was the first or the first sort of blockchain to be a supercomputer. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to program smart contracts in the Ethereum network and implement there. So when you're trying to implement a Web3 framework, you're not really going to go and code a blockchain from scratch. You are going to build on top of an existing blockchain. So whether that's going to be the Ethereum network or you're going to provide building on Polygon or another sort of layer one block or layer one or layer two blockchain. And you're going to take advantage of all the harder and heavy lifting they've done. And you're just going to take advantage of smart contracts and tokens that are available to you as tools. So if we were to build a Web3 application again, that social media app, so let's go back here. Let's go back down to this application right here. How do you think 
the best way to sort of web web three five this applications if you were to make this in a web three format. What do you think the best way to do it? Do you think the best way to do it would be to decentralize the whole database right here and make sure every user has a copy of it and we operate the database like a blockchain? Or do you think the best way to do it is the governance, so the permissions is not dependent in the database, is not linked to the database. The permissions are linked to a network of governance voting and that's executed by a smart contract. So any ideas, what would you rather do? Okay, so Amol thinks we should decentralize the whole database. So no central governing company. Anyone else here have a different idea? Okay, so one drawback of the blockchain we did discuss was if you were to decentralize, if you have a database, it's accessing data is hard. But more than that, it's really computationally expensive to add new blocks. If you were to decentralize the whole database, at some level, you do achieve the thing you want. You, you do achieve the fact that users own the data and there's no central governing company. But it's really computationally expensive. Would it not make sense to decentralize the governance? So you have a network, you have your whole smart, you have a smart contract that takes the voting of every single user and every single stakeholder to see how they want to deal with the data. And the permissions on the database is linked to that. So the database is centralized. It's everything siloed and stored in a central place. But the way the database permissions are set are through a decentralized network of governance. That way, the social media has a say in how they want it. But at the same time, they cannot change the permissions because the permissions are linked to a smart contract. So would that not make more sense? Because it becomes computationally cheaper and you're not adding data that much. You're not changing your permissions unless there's a new proposal. So that's really the base idea here is when you design the application again, we want to decentralize governance. Not to say a mole is wrong. You would decentralize in the database does make sense, but in a social media company where data is so frequent, you're scaling, dealing with scale, it's going to be really computationally expensive. So if you were to now look at a time where you want to decentralize the database, like a mole said, the best way to do it is if you're dealing with medical data. If you're dealing, if I'm going to the doctor and I want to store my data on a blockchain, it makes sense because now no one can change it. And it makes more sense for all the stakeholders, my insurance company, my doctor, they know my medical history, insurance company knows my medical history. I cannot go and change it to get a cheaper premium. And at the same time, I know no one's able to change my medical history for whatever reason. So in that case, you want to decentralize it. So does that make sense to everyone why we would decentralize governance, not data, decentralize the database? Five seconds before I move on. Sounds good. So here's the basic architecture we do have for our sort of Web3 application. So you have your front end layer. Your front end layer can be and developed with whatever you use Vue.js, React, whatever you're developing your front end layer for, you can use it there. Your meta end layer, I like to call this sort of like the layer you're going to have between the blockchain and thing, blockchain and your front end. And this is going to happen on centralized side or decentralized side, and usually happens with both. So if you were to look at that sort of social media app, your centralized side is if you're writing and read, if you're writing, reading and writing. So if you're developing, posting a picture, or you're looking at someone's picture, you're obviously going to interact with the centralized side of the database. But now when you're voting on the application of how you want your data to be governed, you're going to do it through a decentralized side. Both sides are going to be different. But the verification can be done similarly. So Currently, you have verification of what you've done through wallets. If everyone here logs onto any application, any website, you probably see the sign with Google, sign with Facebook, sign with Twitter. Everyone's seen that. So in the Web3 context, this is your Web3 wallet. So MetaMask, Ledger, whichever way, trust, um, just Trustpilot. You have a lot of them. And you could basically go and you could just link your wallet there. And you could go and access all the things. Your backend layer is where you're going to have all these things going on. So your backend layer, your meta layer is going to interact with the, if you're reading and writing, it's going to interact with your backend layer, which is centralized if you're reading and writing. But if you're voting, it's going to interact with your decentralized layer. And that's a basic architecture you're going to have here. If it's a, if it's a Web3 application, most often than not, you're going to wear, verify a lot of involvement through Web3 wallets. And that's like the key idea here. So the front end layer, this is the sort of part that I really just want to dive into before we go forward. 
in the Web3 context, a lot of the front end layer you see is really what your users are going to see too. And when your users see it, they do not care what your back end and mid end layer is. And that's a key important distinction you want to make here. If when you are logging to Facebook, I don't think you guys care what database you're using or how they're verifying your data. You just want to make sure your data is secure. You want to make sure and you, you make sure when your, your login information is secure. So your front end layer, the way the only thing you care about is your front end, how easy it is to use the app. And that's the thing I sort of like to call the opportunity. And that's like a really cool opportunity that's happening with right now. If you guys are looking to get involved in the space is making apps more user-friendly. A lot of Web3 apps are not user-friendly and are geared towards crypto, crypto natives or people like me and people like a lot of people who have been in the space for a long, long time. So you can develop, so you want to develop applications that are easy for the user to have. And your judges in your hackathon, they'll probably notice like, you probably care about what back and a mid-end layer you're using for your thing. And for that one, you could definitely mention you're using a blockchain or Web3 sort of stack, but your front-end layer should be always there that you always assume that your user does not care about what backend you're using. They only care about the app is secure, their data is protected, and they're able to interact with the well, and it's easy to use. So when do you want to use Web3? So this is like the sort of questions I like to call like the three questions you really want to ask if you're one, when you want to have government thing. So governance. So do you want to decentralize the governance and what is the governance of the application, structure of the application? So if you're just social media app, if you want to guard use that. Secondly, transparency. If you want your data to be transparent, you want to make sure it could, you could put it on a web three place and you want to make sure who needs permission to access it. It's kind of lies into governance because you want to make sure if you're, if you're building an application or you want everyone to be able to see it, or you, and you also be able to want to change the permissions based on what the community says, web three is perfect. And lastly, immutability. Do you need your data to change and can it survive if your data is changed, is not changed or changed, sorry. So if you have data like medical data, you're not going to survive if your data has changed. But if you have data like your school grades, if you were to basically put your school grades on blockchain, some school districts do it, but can, your data, can it survive if the data has changed? Yes, clearly. So you wouldn't want Web3 in that format. So sort of, these are three areas you want to look at. Governance, transparency, and immutability. If you, didn't, if you need immut immutability, definitely look at using a blockchain as your backend. If you need transparency, you want to then look at is governance and immutability. So if you don't need governance, if you don't care about who can see it or what are changing permissions to it regularly, and you don't care if your data has changed, a simple Google Sheet or a simple database where everyone can see it works. And governance, if you want to make sure everyone has equal voting rights and you want to make sure it's decentralized across nodes, a Web3 format is the best. So as we just finish up the presentation, the key idea I really want to discuss here is Web3 is not always better. So you want to make sure that you understand which paradigm makes sense. We went back to like the first idea here, which was uh, I really talked about when the Web 2, Web 1, Web 2, Web 3. So it really makes it look sequential. It makes it look like it's chronological that if you want to future proof yourself, you got to build a Web 3 application. That's not the case. I think the best way to look at this is like a layer is a cake. Web 1 is a single layer cake. Web 2 is a double layer cake. Web 3 is a three layered cake. A three-layered cake does not make sense for every single location. You don't want to casually go and eat a three-layered cake. It doesn't fit the occasion. But at the same time, at a wedding, you don't want to serve a one-layered cake. So it's obviously understanding in that sort of scenario, like, does that, am I eating it? Am I presenting the right cake for the right locations? Like, am I presenting the right web framework for the right application? And that's the best way to do it. Even when Web 2 came into effect, we were still, we're still using Web 1 formats. For a lot of you guys who have personal websites out there, a lot of like information sites you do have, what you, no one can read or write. Those are built on Web 1 frameworks and when they still survive today, they do pretty well. And they're going to survive for the future on Web 3, Web 4, Web 5, whatever happens in the future. Similar with Web 2, if the app makes sense in a Web 2 format, build it that way. A Web 3 format is not really going to go and help you score or really help you take your product to the next level. Might help you win a hackathon, but after that, if you really want to take a project further, it's not really going to add a lot of value in there. So those are the sort of closing thought we have here is Web3 is not always better. And these are places if you guys want to connect with me. Now, I remember we had a question from Monica. So I'll, I'll answer that question. And uh, for anyone who has other questions, please put them in the chat or unmute yourself and ask. So I remember Monica asked that, isn't this a conundrum? Web3 is decentralized, but on a minority of companies hold a majority stake at the moment. It's actually a really interesting thing. I was just re researching about this a lot more in the past. It's a problem that's happening there because a lot of venture capital firms and a lot of early believers in the space 
are getting a lot involved. So in recent Horowitz, if you, for those that don't know, it's one of the Silicon Valley's largest investment firms, VC firm. These guys are essentially like investing heavily in Web3 projects. They have like billions of dollars in there. You have a lot of other firms that are like this, Bain Capital, Pantera Capital, a lot of these different firms, and they're investing heavily in Web3, and they own a lot of like stake in certain Web3 projects. So when they dump, so when they sell their stake to make a profit, it really just tanks the whole system. It is a problem because it really just doesn't achieve what users want to achieve because they have a lot more voting rights. But at the same time, it really just shows us or really just gives more motivation for us to get more involved in the space as users because we could change that. Web3 itself is a really good proof of concept for everyone. I think it's a really cool thing that's happening. As long as we're allowed to own our data, we're allowed to use that forward. So if more of us get involved, we're really going to see that thing go start going down. And I remember we talked about proof of stake previously. The Ethereum network now, it's Ethereum networks moving to proof of stake from proof of work because of the issues that happen when scaling it. That's also another problem where you have, you need almost 32 Ethereum to become a staking node in there. And that really puts, really just cent centralizes the system more than decentralizing it. And that's another problem. So there are lots of sort of circular problems you have in this space. And those are solution answers that everyone's trying to find problems. Those are problems that everyone's trying to find answers to. Uh, I wish I could give a better answer on why that's not a big problem, but it's something that we're all trying to figure out in the space. Brad asks, any resources I recommend to learn about Web3? Oh, uh, I think the best sort of resource, it depends where you're trying to learn it. If you're trying to learn about development Web3, there's a really cool thing, learnweb3.io. That one's run by someone I know. It's a pretty sick website and a pretty sick like way to learn it. They give you a whole certification. It's pretty cool there. If you're trying to learn how to invest, I think the best, if you're trying to like you know, invest in Web3 or really get involved in the business capacity of it, Starlight Kitchen, shameless plug right here, but no, we're getting, we're pushing out a content curriculum coming soon this year. If you really want to learn a bit faster, I think the best way to learn it is Whiteboard Crypto. It really just gives, it's a YouTube channel. It really gives everything broken down to the first principle. So those are two things I would recommend to learn about Web3. And I think the most important way if you're really just trying to learn here is just build in the space. Just get yourself a MetaMask wallet, connect it, and either if you have money, if you have money to spare, just get involved and start investing and understanding investing projects you know. And if you lose money in projects, you'll understand things and just read up on the space. If you guys keep up track with Luna, Terra Luna crash, you guys can start learning a lot more about tokenomics in that sense, incentive design and how those might fail at certain points. So those are some good resources you guys you guys can take advantage of if you guys want to learn more about the web three space in greater depth and understand how it could probably help you in your application when you're both for the hackathon or get involved in something. Any question? Any more questions we have here? Okay, so I did say I was going to talk a little bit about Starlight Kitchen before we closed off. So Starlight Kitchen, we're like a startup advisory firm. I did mention like who we work with. So a lot of you guys are going to have projects you're building throughout the hackathon. If you guys are really interested in, if you guys build something really sick related to Web3 and you guys want to know, okay, we have a sick product here. We really want to take this to the next level. We want to know how we can use, implement like some sort of incentive design in this, tokenomics for this place. We want to look at revenue models. We want to see how we can take our product from zero to hero and basically start raising funding. Starlight Kitchen will basically, I'd love to chat with you, see if you'd be see if we could fit you into our accelerator, see what resources we can provide you with. And we could basically get you to the next stage where you guys can build a market ready product. Along with that, we have a lot more resources. We have a newsletter coming out. So if you guys check my Twitter out, kind of shameless plug. Yeah, we have a newsletter coming out. You guys can read that up. It's, we cover a unique Web3 startup run by students, run by someone who's recently graduated every couple of weeks. We also cover a lot of startup and innovation theory. So if you guys are really looking to get more in the space, that's a great way to get involved in space. So that's it for me. Uh, if there are any closing questions, love to take them. If you guys have any further questions, you guys can definitely reach out to me at the socials right here. Yeah, it was great being here. Thank you for having me. We're good. Thank you so much, Jay. This is a really great presentation. Thank you. All right, if anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out to Jay um, either through email or LinkedIn. Um, and if you have any projects that you work on that are Web3 based, make sure to reach out to him um, and his firm. Yeah, for sure. Looking to chat.